Good day to everyone who's joined us today. I'm Terrell Strayhorn, Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs here at Virginia Union University in the lovely city of Richmond, Virginia. Virginia Union is one of the nation's premier urban research institutions with a strong liberal arts tradition. We're a university that's on the move with a dynamic vision, a historic mission, and an unapologetic commitment to educating leaders who are ready to secure the promise of a limitless future. Today, you are joining us as part of our VUU Global and the Presidential Distinguished Lecture Series through the Center for the Study of HBCUs that I direct at the center. Before we get started with our special guests, I want to offer a couple of comments. First, on behalf of the center, thank you for joining us today. We're delighted to have Dr. Boykin Sanders, who is our new director of our inaugural presidential lecture series. We are so excited as a university to launch VUU Global, which allows us to take the HBCU experience to the world. And I know listening today in the audience is our interim dean for VUU Global, Dr. Latrell Green. In a moment, I'm going to introduce our special guest, and then he's going to come in his own way and deliver his distinguished lecture. During that time, if you have questions, we invite you to use the Q&A dialog box that you see in the upper right hand corner of your screen to log your questions, place them there, and the new research associate for the Center for the Study of HBCUs, Jordan Bonner, and our team will be observing the box throughout the lecture and at the end we will raise questions as time permits for Roland Martin to respond to. So please familiarize yourself with the Q&A box and then place your comments there. You can also use it to say hello and do a roll call and shout outs. I know we got a lot of members of Panther Nation, the HBCU community with us today. It's an exciting time here at Virginia Union University. And without further ado, it is my great pleasure to announce on behalf of our president, Dr. Hakeem J. Lucas, who is the executive director of the Center for the Study of HBCUs and really the brain child, the, the uh, distinguished lecture series is his own brain child. It's my great pleasure to introduce to some and to present to others our speaker after this short break. All right, all right. Can y'all hear me? Nope, we still got the slide up. So, all right. They gonna let me know what's going on. All right. Welcome back and it's my great pleasure to introduce to some present to others our first distinguished lecturer, Roland Martin, journalist, columnist and commentator. Roland Martin was born in Houston, Texas, third world, third ward, the center of Houston's African American community. Everyone knows Roland Martin. We know that he's a renowned journalist. 
He uh, attended Texas A&M University on an academic scholarship where he studied journalism and worked for the Bryan College Station Eagle and KBTX Channel 3. As a junior in college, Martin made the right decision to pledge Pi Omicron Chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, and he also attended the National Association of Black Journalists Convention. He's a remarkable speaker, a talented commentator, a social analyst in his own right. It's my great pleasure to introduce. Go ahead. All right, we good? Okay, am, am I up? Is everybody seeing me? Well, that's a way to check. You're live. We're actually live streaming. Uh, I can check the video stream myself. All right, folks. Uh, how's everyone doing? Virginia Union, glad to have all of you here. So here's the deal, y'all. True. So um, I, we, this is all virtual, but I'm actually on campus. I know that sounds crazy, uh, but I was in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, Reverend Dr. William Barber hit me up on uh, Sunday. He said, hey, man, uh, early voting has started. We got five black people who are elected statewide. Uh, can you come and do your show from Raleigh, North Carolina? And so I said, absolutely. And so yesterday we stopped by North Carolina A&T in Greensboro and we stopped by North Carolina Central uh, in Durham. Then we went to, of course, the early voting location in Raleigh. And so this was at noon. And so I could have stayed in Raleigh to do this virtually. If I did that, I would not have been able to get to my show in time because if I'm done at 1 or 1 30, it's a four and a half hour drive. And so uh, and so the campus was only two and a half hours. So it really was right between so it was two and a half hours away. From me. So I said, why not drive to Virginia Union, uh, do the virtual, uh, do the, do this lecture, and then when I'm done, drive back uh, to D.C. or to be able to do Roller Martin Unfiltered Live uh, at uh, 6 p.m. Eastern. So, so, I'm, so I'm glad to be here, glad to be back on campus. I've been here before. Uh, we actually did a project, uh, included uh, Virginia Union. I did a project for Active One. Uh, and uh, AT&T, where we focused on uh, the great work that um, different uh, HBCU professors were doing. And so, uh, again, so glad, so glad to be here. Uh, let me share uh, Liquid Soul, with my frat brother, uh, as well, uh, for uh, reaching out to me for making this possible. So I would certainly want to thank uh, everybody for, for making this possible. Uh, we're living in a completely virtual world. And it really is not foreign to me because in my entire career, I have been focused on uh, multimedia. Uh, what I mean by that is I went to Jack Hayes High School, Magnus School of Communications. So uh, since the age of 14, I've been doing media, television, newspaper, radio, uh, and digital, frankly, is a combination of all of that. It's just simply a delivery system. Uh, and in my entire career, uh, I've been doing all the different mediums. And so I remember we had a convergence workshop uh, at Columbia University. Uh, it was the first, it was when they first started even using the phrase uh, media convergence. Uh, and I was the only person in the room who had already done all the different mediums. And so this is really where we are in terms of our media today, uh, in terms of how they've all converged. And so what I want to be able to do, what I want to be able to do is want to bring me some water, please. Uh, what I want to be able to do, and literally, folks, I just got out of the car, so jump out, driving right here. Now, grab me one of those waters, please. So, so I want to talk about uh, the past, present, and future of black media, and, and and the reason this is important. The reason this is important. And by the way, thank you very much. By the way, we're also live streaming this on all of my platform as well. And see, that speaks to I'm, I'm a little bit later that speaks to the different world that we're living in and how we are to use digital technology in a completely different way uh, here in um, here in uh, 2020. And really, this is not the future of media. It's actually the present of media. And I believe that black media is woefully unprepared for this moment, which means that black media is very much going to be um, potentially deceased in the future. Let's be confronted with something right now and come back to that particular lecture. March 16, 1827, the first black newspaper, Freedom Journal, was created. 
Uh, you had Samuel Cornish, John Russ were the first two editors. Now, a lot of people, a lot of people uh, often say that, J that John R Russworm and Samuel Cornish were the owners of Freedom's Journal. That is incorrect. Not the owners of Freedom's Journal. They were the first editors of Freedom's Journal. And the black press uses this particular phrase that they use in their uh, lead editorial to serve as a clarion call, if you will, for black media today. And that is this here. The phrase, we wish to plead our own cause. Too long have others spoke for us. Uh, if, if anybody has worked at a black paper, they've used that phrase before. It is a phrase uh, that the Black Press of America, NNPA, the National Newspaper Publishers Association, often used to describe our mission is. And that really is, that really is uh, our particular mission. When you talk about, when you hear that phrase, we wish to plead our own cause, long have others spoken for us. What that means is that we in black media, black owned media, and a little bit later, I'm gonna break down for you folks why we must be careful when it comes to black targeted media and black owned media. The reason that phrase is so important is because what it does is it enforces front how stories are being told through what eyes, through what prism they're being told. So when you have a story that is being told through a black prism versus a story being told through a white prism, I'm going to explain to you what happens. When I worked at the Four Star Telegram, I was a city hall reporter. Uh, Khalid Muhammad, uh, the former national spokesman for the Nation of Islam, came to speak in, came to speak uh, in uh, Fort Worth. And what was interesting is that, he, so I worked at the Fort Worth Star Telegram, and then that was the Dallas Morning News. And both of us were the largest papers in DFW. And what was interesting is that, um, Khaled comes to speak, he had been suspended by Nation of Islam leader, Louis Farrakhan. And the next morning, there were two stories about Khalid Muhammad's speech. That was the Mor Dallas Morning News written by a white staff. That was my story that was written. Now, what was interesting about these two stories is that here was the same speaker at the same event, but you really had two different views of the same speech. And so I got called into the office by the editor, Debbie Price, and she had a copy of the Dallas Morning News. And she had a copy of my, my story. And then she asked me, why are these stories different? And I said to her, why in the hell are you talking to me? You need to go call his ass at the Dallas Morning News. See, what was different was that the white staff wrote about all the security and how everybody had to get checked and how they checked everything. I'm black. Public Nation of Islam events. That's no big deal to me. So, me, it's an event story. But here's the deal. I've the governor has spoken. And the president has spoken. Guess what they have? Security. So I didn't see the relevance of putting that in the story, but he did. There were phrases Kyle we use, you know, I came here not to pin the tail on the donkey, but to pin the, on the honky. Anybody who is native of Islam events, we all know all of the verbal, uh, the verbal things used to get the crowd all excited and hype, whatever. Y'all, it wasn't any big deal to me. But again, the white Dallas Morning News reporter saw it differently. Now, what I did was I actually listened to what Muhammad was saying. I was actually discerning what Khalid Muhammad was saying. And the and the and the the, the, the the crux of his speech was this. He said, 
I'm not going to do the Farrakhan what Malcolm X did to Elijah Muhammad. And so if you read these two stories, you would have come up, you would have come away with two different conclusions from the same story. Now, although the Fort Worth Star Telegram is a daily newspaper, mainstream media, uh, Disney, uh, Disney, Cap Cities, ABC owner at the time, that gives you an understanding of how a white reporter and a black reporter saw the exact same story totally different. That also describes black media. Because in our history, we look at the world differently because we wake up black every day. Now, some of y'all watching right now going, okay, I I'm not really understanding. What do you mean you wake up black every day? I'm black and I wake up black. No, you can be black, but do you wake up black every day? Some of y'all right now are still confused. Mm -hmm. What the phrase means is that when you work in black media, you have a black media prism, which means what we cover and how we see things are different. When you have been, when you've worked in mainstream media, you have been trained to think mainstream. You have been trained to think that's a story, that's not a story. You have been trained and conditioned to think that's important and that's not important. Because when you say mainstream media, really what you mean is white. I'm just being very honest. You can have all the multiculturalism in the world, but the reality is mainstream media is appealing to a white audience. That's what mainstream is. You don't believe me? Listen to folks have a conversation when they say, oh, uh, these politicians, they are targeting black voters. They're targeting Latino voters. Then they say, then they're targeting rural voters. Huh? How did you carve out black voters? How did you carve out Latino voters? But then they're just voters. What they really mean is white. In this nation, white folks have never had to designate themselves as white. So when you say mainstream media, you really mean white. That's really what you mean. And so that's why you have the distinction. And for those who understand, so coming out of slavery, uh, where people of African descent were enslaved, in the period of Jim Crow, we understood that we needed mediums that were telling our story as opposed to depending on somebody else. Freedom's Journal, 1827, another 40 years before uh, slavery and civil war uh, takes place in slave and slavery ends, technically. They understood that we needed to be speaking to free slaves or speaking to free black people in a much different way because the stories that, was, that were being covered in mainstream were completely different. What we have to understand today is this. There was a time for a long period of time but when you're you are black and you got married, it was irrelevant to mainstream media. If you went to college and graduated, it was irrelevant. What black people did was irrelevant. It wasn't covered in daily newspapers all around the country. Well, I mean, literally, black people weren't even mentioned. Black people weren't even shown. The things that black people did were completely non-existent to mainstream media. White folks did not care at all about black life. Yet black newspapers served as the vehicle that covered black people, that revealed the things that we were doing, that showed black people 
uh, getting married, black folks passing away, black folks taking vacations, black people buying cars, black people buying homes, black people opening businesses. It really served as the conduit from one black person to the other, and it showed us in our humanity. So mainstream media show us as evil, showed us as criminals, showed us as decadent, showed us as depraved, and then you have black media that showed us in our humanity. But the other value of black media is that black media also spoke a level of truth that was principle, that was undeniable, that was unfiltered from mainstream media. So here you have media writing about lynching, Ida B. Wells Barnett being so truthful about lynching in America that white folks put a bounty out on her head, burned down uh, the building where she worked. She, she was on the run around the country seeking refuge because she dared to write the truth. I'm going to mention a number of books, and so y'all got to keep up. I'm not going to show them. If I was at home, I would just grab the book, but I'm not. Uh, Ethan McKaylee has a great book on the Chicago Defender. Ethan McKaylee has a great book on the Chicago Defender. And in that book, he talks about, again, what stories were being covered and how they were being covered. Uh, he also relays this important thing. During World War II, the federal government under President Franklin Delano Roosevelt actually threatened to charge black newspapers with treason. Why? Because black newspapers like the Pittsburgh Courier and the Chicago Defender and others were writing about racism in the armed forces. The federal government of the United States of America, which was fighting fascism and was fighting Nazis in Germany, literally tried to, no, not tried, they threatened black newspapers saying, we will shut you down and put you in jail because how dare you write about racism in the armed services. They said, y'all are creating dissension among the troops and we need everybody in America focused on beating the Nazis. And I want y'all to let that marinate. America was saying, wait, we don't wanna hear y'all talking about racism. America was saying, we don't wanna hear y'all telling the actual story of what black soldiers are going through all around the world. We want y'all to wave the flag and say America is wonderful because see in America, they've always desired for black people to sit our blackness aside and then wear the American flag. For white America, they've never come to the conclusion that we can wear our blackness and the American flag at the same time and then call out what America has done while still being black, while still being patriotic, while still paying taxes, while still loving America. See, they don't understand that. That's why all these white folks never understood, could not comprehend Colin Kaepernick. What are you doing taking a knee? This is America, how dare you? No, when we open the NFL game, we gotta have the flyover. We gotta have the halftime appreciation for the troops and the first responders. How dare you? How dare you take a knee and speak against police brutality while we white folks are trying to sit at home so y'all can entertain us? 
What they never understood was that every time one of those cops was beating somebody black and shooting somebody black, that was a American flag patch on their uniform. They were doing it under the color of law. So the black press has always, has always shown America for who she really is. And America has never been able to deal with what the black press was showing. So the black press has served as the true mirror in the country. We, we say that the New York Times is the gold standard. All the news fit to print. They talk about Washington Post. They talk about the Wall Street Journal. They talk about the golden era of, under Otis Chandler of the LA Times. The Bingham family in Kentucky. Uh, you have the Cox sisters uh, with the Atlanta Journal Constitution. We can go, we can go on, on all, all these folks, but the reality is this here: for Black people, Hank Dickerson, the Pittsburgh Courier, Robert Abbott, who founded the Chicago Defender, Frederick Douglass, who created the North Star, A.I. Scott, who created the Atlanta Daily World. Uh, you have um, uh, under John Sintak, who took over the Chicago Defender uh, after it was passed to him from Robert Abbott. He sends Louis Martin to Detroit to create the Michigan Chronicle. John H. Johnson, growing up in Arkansas, reading the Chicago Defender. Family moves to Chicago. He creates Negro Digest, then Jet Magazine, then Ebony. I can go on and on with other black newspapers all across the country. William Monroe Trotter challenging Woodrow Wilson in the White House. Woodrow Wilson, one of the greatest racists ever to sit in the Oval Office, gets so mad, how dare this Negro question me in the White House, get the hell out. Woodrow Wilson literally throws William Monroe Trotter out of the White House. How dare you as a black man question me? And it's William Monroe Trotter who in Boston leads the national effort against the airing of the birth of a nation. The very movie that glorified the KKK that was revered around America and a movie that Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson showed in the White House. It was William Monroe Trotter using the power of black media in Boston that led, that led to the national pushback against that particular movie and challenged Boston leaders um, to actually not air. There was a great documentary uh, on uh, on this very thing, uh, I'm going to I'm going to name the book for you on our shelf. There's a lot of books on uh, the black press. Uh, it is so. There are several books. There's a book called The Guardian of Boston, William Monroe Trotter, uh, by Stephen Fox. There's another book called Black Radical: The Life and Times of William Monroe Trotter. That's another book uh, that that you, that, that you want. To uh, that you want you want to get, and so uh, PBS did a documentary on Trotter and his battles against Birth of a Nation. All of these things are important. When you talk about Douglas, uh, it's, it, it, it's important to talk about the writings and how Black people use media to be able to drive messaging. I was just uh, just it's, it's, I don't think we really understand. This is really I don't think we really understand that were it not for black media, there is no way black people would have been able to survive the Reconstruction period, the Jim Crow, and the Civil Rights Movement. But let me say that again. There is no way black people 
would have been able to survive any of these periods were it not for the black press. The black press served as the, the, the point of information. If you read the book called The Lonely Warrior on Robert Abbott, again, another phenomenal book. Um, that book is so important because it talks about the life and times of, of Robert Abbott. And in that book, and this story has been told, Ethan McKaylee talks about it uh, in his, uh, in, in his uh, book as well on the Chicago Defender. Um, he talks about why folks were so angry uh, on with black newspapers and Chicago Defender. What they did was, y'all, they literally outlawed the Chicago Defender from being sold down south. So what Abbott did was he got with the Pullman carporters. He got with the Pullman carporters. And what he did was he, <laughs> what they would do is they would, they would put the defender on the trains and the Pullman carporters would hide the, the paper. And then before they would get to a town, the Pullman carporters would toss the paper off the back of the train and little black boys would then run and grab the papers and then bring them into town and then sell and disseminate them to black folks all around town. Y'all might be saying, well, why were the white folks freaking out? Because black people in the South were actually reading about what was happening with, with, with uh, Jim Crow and lynching. And then black folks were reading about the opportunities, albeit not great, but much better than the South where the Klan was sitting there killing folks. They began to move and that's how the great migration really began. The Chicago Defender, black newspaper, played the role in one of the greatest transfers from the South because Black people in Mississippi and Alabama and Florida and Louisiana and Texas and Georgia and Arkansas and Tennessee and South Carolina and North Carolina and Virginia were reading about all of these things that black folks were doing in Chicago, in Gary, Indiana, in Detroit, and they began to move north because of what they were reading in the black newspaper. But, but let me tell you how cold Robert Abbott was. Robert Abbott also used the power of the newspaper to also tell black folks how they should act when they move up north. Tell him, take your hog calling clothes off uh, and put on your fine suits. The newspaper was used as a communications tool, not just for news, but also culture. I was in, uh, and just for all folks to understand, I've run three black newspapers. I've run the Dallas Weekly, I've run the Houston Defender, and I've been executive editor and, man and general manager of the Chicago Defender. And when I was in Chicago, that was, that was a black restaurant, it was a sports bar. And what they did was they used old copies of the Defender to serve as, uh, and it was, it was printed copies, and it served as the film that was over the bathroom stalls. Y'all, this is a true story. So imagine me sitting here. I, I, I go to the bathroom. And I had seen, you know, old copies of the Chicago Defender. So I'm standing there at a urinal. And I'm, I'm looking at these old copies of the Defender. And they had this small, they had this article on a cricket match being played at Jackson Park. And I'm sitting and I'm like, what? I'm literally looking and I, and I see the date of the paper. And the Chicago Defender was writing about these people of African descent who were from 
London, some who were from Africa, and there was a cricket match in the park. And then I started looking at other stories. So basically what the Defender and the Pittsburgh Courier and Land Daily were, what they, they were covering all of who we are, all of this blackness that was being shown in these pages. Another book, Gerald Horn has an amazing book uh, on Claude Barnett. And um, I, I've worked in black media for years and it wasn't until Gerald did this book that I even learned about who Claude Barnett was. That's a great book. That's a great book. It is called, hold on one second. It's called The Rise and Fall of the Associated Negro Press. Claude Barnett's Pan-African News and the Jim Crow Paradox. The Rise and Fall of the Associated Negro Press. Claude Barnett's Pan-African News and the Jim Crow Paradox. Claude Barnett was assembling, in essence, these packets of information that he was then sending out to various black newspapers. His, his, the, these, these packets of news in these dispatches included African Americans who were traveling abroad, African Americans who were artists. It included black folks who were in world, uh, who were in World War, II, black folks who were in during World War II who were traveling uh, to uh, where war was taking place and were sending back dispatches. Uh, there were African Americans. Uh, there were people who were in Moscow, who were in Russia, folks who were who were in Europe, who were in Italy, and they were sending these reports back. Not in the New York Times, not in the Washington Post, not in any of these mainstream papers, but through Claude Barnett's Pan African News, the Associated Negro Pe Press, and then he had a connection to all these African nations. Now here's the deal: he wasn't making any money from this. His, he was really making his money by his relationships and business deals. Uh, with African nations like Ghana and others. But the thing about this, it was so impressive that even white newspapers begin to look at this and say, man, we might want to start writing, covering some of this stuff or carrying this because they were having stuff that even the white writers didn't have. And so Claude Burnett was able to uh, assemble this. But I want to go back to this last line. Claude Burnett's Pan-African News and the Jim Crow paradox. And y'all might say, well, why are you focusing on that? Because it's the Jim Crow paradox part. Black newspapers, the black press, were the ones who issued the clarion call to beat back Jim Crow. In the Chicago Defender, Robert Abbott listed the mission, the things they wanted to attack. And every time they achieved one of those, they would remove one of those planks and they might add another one. But here's the problem. As Gerald Horn writes, for every success of the black press, it actually ended up being the demise of the black press. I need y'all to hear me clearly. For every success of the black press in highlighting, in exposing racism, discrimination, and Jim Crow. It then also led to its own demise. The black press covered the Negro leagues extensively. But Major League Baseball would not let black folks even in the press boxes. Black folks were excited rightfully when Jackie Robinson was signed by the Brooklyn Dodgers. But I need y'all to listen to the, to, 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 to the words I'm using. 
the black press was, excuse me, it was the Negro Leagues and the Major Leagues. I need y'all to listen to this very clearly. Negro Leagues, Major Leagues. What white people were saying, this is the Major Leagues. This is professional baseball. Y'all are in the Negro Leagues, meaning y'all aren't professional. When in reality, there was more great talent in the Negro Leagues than in the Major Leagues. What the Major Leagues had was white money. Better stadiums, better lighting, better fields, better uniform, better food, better travel, higher salaries. That was all a byproduct of whiteness. Negro leagues had the raw talent, but didn't have all of the accoutrements that they did. Why is this important? Because when Jackie Robinson goes to the major leagues to break the race barrier. That began, listen to me clearly, that began for black people to celebrate Jackie Robinson is in the majors, but it leads to the decline and the demise of the Negro Leagues, which were mostly black owned. So what did we trade for acceptance in Major League Baseball, we lost black ownership and control of the Negro Leagues. And there's somebody who's saying to me, so Roland, are you saying that we should not have been fighting for that? No, what I'm saying is be very careful what you ask for when you start breaking down those walls. I go back to Gerald Horn's last line. Claude Barnett's Pan-African News in the Jim Crow Paradox. Claude Barnett began to realize that as he and his other black newspapers kept chipping away at Jim Crow, that it actually was hurting them because they had a captive audience who read their work, who bought their papers. Robert Abbott was driving a Rolls Royce. Robert Abbott the final Chicago Defender was a multimillionaire. He would wear his top hat and cane and ride around Chicago in his Rolls Royce because black people made him rich. But what happened? The black coverage began all of a sudden as black newspapers hitting all these issues. All of a sudden, white newspapers began to civil rights movement begins to happen. Now, all of a sudden, they, they know, remember, not just Chicago Defenders, 19, 1905. Here's what happened. They, uh, they were oh, yeah, fine, we cover y'all. Ah, sure, New York Times, they might cover Adam Clayton Powell, some other stuff in the, in the 30s and 40s. But stuff really doesn't heat up until 1954, Brown versus Board of Education. Then Emmett Till gets uh, killed August 28, 1955. And the Montgomery Bus Boycott begins December 1955. All of this is being covered by black media. Y'all do understand that writers for the Chicago Defender and the Michigan Tri-State Defender helped in actually locating witnesses who had fled Mississippi. One of them, one of the reporters, drew the witness under the cover of night back to Mississippi to testify in the case of Emmett Till. Black newspapers did that. It also won uh, another great book. Uh, this brother here was on the front lines uh, of it. His name is Simeon Booker. For many people, have read it. for 50 years, he was the Washington bureau chief for uh, Jet Magazine. But he has a book called Conscience, a reporter's account of the civil rights movement. Simeon Booker was one of those people. And so what happened was black press was covering the civil rights movement. White folks were not there. They were not there. Um, and then and then all of a sudden, uh, then as it began to heat up and as more resources began to get thrown 
uh, to this, all of a sudden, white media now begins to step in and begins to cover this movement. And then what happened is there's a shift where the resources of white media begins to swamp black media. And then all of a sudden, listen to me, even those civil rights leaders begin to see, oh, CBS is bigger. There was no black network. There was no black TV network. So now we can now reach the country and the world. So you got CBS and ABC and NBC, and now Newsweek is here, and now Time Magazine is here. And now, and all of a sudden, black leadership now begins to also, and they still included black media, but they were also playing to white media. But here's also what happened. Black media had to take a had to take a had to take a back seat to white media during the civil rights movement because black people were being beaten and killed. That's another book, one of Pulitzer Prize. It's by Gene Roberts and Hank uh, Klibanoff. I have a couple copies of the book. It's called The Race Beat: The Press, the Civil Rights Struggle, and the Awakening of a Nation. When you read that book. They write in the book how if it was not for the black press covering the civil rights movement, serving as the foundation, you would not have had these white media entities then coming in, being able to cover the movement. So you had all of these things that are going on. And so all of a sudden, if you were black, you could no longer cover the rally because you were getting beaten and killed. In fact, Little Rock, Arkansas, 1957, uh, one of the staffers, was beaten, he was a photographer, writer, was beaten uh, there in Little Rock, later died from those injuries. Like media was still important. When Daisy Bates, y'all realize, Daisy Bates owned a black newspaper. When Daisy Bates, when they were planning the Little Rock, uh, Little Rock Nine, the black paper was in the planning meeting. That's why we all see all these photos, the intimate photos about the King and Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali, because black paper were there. Black paper, they were basically living there. You could go to every, you could go to every city in America, and that was this, that was the black photographer who shot everybody. Because white people ignored us. So black media served as key point for us to be able to access our own culture. As we go through the 50s, now we get to the 60s, now we see a shift. In Paul Burnett, uh, in Gerald Horn's book, he talks about Alex Dunnigan. He is where Alex Dunnigan was angry that she was getting paid pennies by Paul Barnett and how she could not afford what happened. He didn't see a need, so therefore he decided not 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 to pay, not to pay her. And so Alice left, got a job elsewhere. I got this book as well. Get this called Alone Atop the Hill, the autobiography of Alice Dunnigan, pioneer of the national black press. Alice Dunnigan was sitting here writing these stories, but Alice Dunnigan, like I can't live for this. I can't. I can't. I'm gonna have to leave the business. I can't own this. So what happened? White media had more money. Same as the Negro Leagues. Better resources, better travel, better money. You black, you got a skill set, you want to make more. So what happened? You begin to have an exodus. Before, the only place a lot of these black folks could work were in black newspapers. White newspapers simply were not hiring them. But it began to change in the late 50s and now early 60s. And now you begin to see more and more black folks who could only work at black newspapers begin to make the shift. You had amazing black journalists, Ethel Payne, Chicago Defender, Chuck Stone, Lerone Bennett was there at Ebony and Jet, Ted Poston, I can go on and on and on. Mal Good was the first African American correspondent for a major network at ABC. In the 60s come along. Damn the 1967 race riots. They disagreed about everything. They come to the conclusion that there are two American white, one black, 
and they chastised the media for having for their coverage of the race riots because they said you did not have enough diversity. So the first wave of black journalists in television took place after the Kerner Commission was re report was released in 1968. And then when that happened, you then begin to have an influx, slowly but surely, of black folks migrating from black newspapers over to mainstream. So you begin to see the first black reporters at the New York Times and the Daily News, and the New York Post and the Washington Post. And you start going on and on and on. Where were they coming from? Black newspapers. Problem was that black newspapers were now caught in a conundrum because they could not afford, they, they were not getting the same advertising dollars then and now as white media. They could not afford to pay competitive salaries. And the problem is those black papers had such a monopoly on black talent that they were not preparing for the day when that black talent was going to leave. That's why I use the Negro Lease as an example. So we go through the late 1960s, we go into the 1970s. So now all of a sudden, these major black newspapers, the Chicago Defender and the Pittsburgh Courier and the Memphis Tri-State Defender and the Atlanta Daily World and all these papers, Philadelphia Tribune. And now you start talking about uh, St. Louis American and we can go on and on. Now all of a sudden, they're now caught because I had a captive audience, black people, that the white folks were not paying attention to. I had captive staff, because the black staff was couldn't work nowhere else. So I'm living my best life. Chicago Defender goes from a weekly to a daily. It was called the Atlanta Daily World. Once you get out of the 60s, and once you end that second reconstruction period of the civil rights movement, what happened? Integration, the ending of Jim Crow, led to the demise of black media. The Chicago Defender was so powerful, the Pittsburgh Courier was so powerful that the White House read every word that was in their newspapers because they spoke for millions of black people. So you get into 19, early 70s, they begin to lose their influence. Now they're trying to figure out how do we now navigate in this world where now white media is talking to our customers? They're now taking our talent. How do we now compete? Because we aren't constructed to compete against them because same as Major League Baseball. They got more money. They got more resources. We cannot compete. And so black press goes through this period of angst from 1970 through the 1980s. In short, in the 70s, Black Enterprise comes along, Essence comes along. John H. Johnson had the whole Black magazine market to himself. He became one of the richest Americans. He had it all to himself, and he wasn't a fan of that. He was not a fan of that. If you read, uh, if you read uh, several different books, uh, Brett Pulley has a great book uh, on uh, BET Bob Johnson. Uh, that book is called uh, The Billion Dollar Bet, Robert Johnson and the Inside Story of Black Entertainment Television. You also have uh, Ed Lewis has his book uh, dealing with essence uh, where I can't wait to Susan Taylor uh, one day sits down and writes her book on essence. But uh, Ed Lewis writes, wrote a book uh, talking about uh, the issue of Essence Magazine, uh, excuse me, the history of Essence Magazine, uh, and I'm looking for it right now. I'm going to pull up in a second uh, his particular book, uh, and um, I have that book as well. And he talked about how John H. Johnson actually tried to buy shares of Essence because he wanted to put them out of business because he felt they were actually competing with him. Earl Gray's, of course, launches 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 of black enterprise and what then happened essence creates the black luxury market because these major advertisers were not 
advertising in black media. John H. Johnson with Ebony Magazine forced major companies to respect the black consumer. There are often times when those folks went on, on calls together because they were using the power of black media. And so what ends up happening is we now have black magazines, but we don't have a full black media. You don't get your first black network. You had, of course, you had some black radio networks were launched, American Urban Radio Network and others. You had some black owned radio stations that were not plentiful, but they begin, they begin to be there as well. Then you get into the 1980s and you had BET that launches. Uh, then, uh, then all of a sudden you begin to see the tax credits uh, in Congress that allowed for an increase in black uh, radio ownership. But then the 1996 Telecommunications Act signed by Bill Clinton was a death knell because that then led to media consolidation. And so the progress that we had with black radio ownership began to go down because they began to get bought by uh, the major. They could not compete. You could not compete against the company owning 100 radio stations uh, like Clear Channel, which is now iHeart, when you only own one or two, two stations because it all became about scale. And so we come into 1980s and 1990s. And again, we've got magazines. And we've got black newspapers that are withering on the vine. 2004, when I took over the Chicago Defender, y'all, they had lost money for 20 straight years. 20 straight years, the other, the Michigan Chronicle, or the Memphis paper, the Pittsburgh paper, were funding or covering the losses of that great institution. So we go into the 80s and 90s, and then we all of a sudden go into 2000. go again. Going launches like AmericaWeb.com and force what he he indicated. The problem is you had a few at the top, but really where most of our stuff was the bottom. And so black newspapers began to fall and fall, circulation fall and fall and fall and fall and fall and fall and fall. And fall, and fall. So where are we now? The problem is where we are now is that we're living in the world right now, not black owned media, but black targeted media. BT sold to Viacom for $3.3 billion. I'm not begrudging that. The reality is Bob Johnson and Sheila Johnson built a significant uh, product there. But if you read Brett Pulley's book, BT should have been sold for $10 billion. BT was getting $1,500 per 30-second ad. The MTV comparable network was getting $8,000 per ad. What does that mean? That means that white advertisers who control the budgets, they view white viewers far more important than black viewers. So therefore, the black viewer was only worth $1,500 per 30-second ad. The white viewer was worth $8,000 per ad. I go back to the Negro League, Major League Baseball comparison. Folks, what we have to understand is that black people have always been devalued in this country. Black people have always been marginalized in this country, and it shows up in the ad dollars. What is, why does that matter? It matters because if you then, if you devalue the black consumer, that means that you're paying black media less money than other folks. So therefore, black media has no ability to actually create capacity and get larger and bigger, which means that you will never see a black media outlet that can compete against a New York Times because we don't get to have the same resources as a New York Times. We have the same talent. We have the same uh, experience. I go back Negro Leagues in baseball. It comes down to the money. And so here we are today. And so when you begin to say, uh, look at the black websites, the root uh, website, not black owned. The Grio was black, started black owned, sold to NBC, Byron Allen buys it back, so now it's back to being black owned. When you start going to black voices, started off as being black owned and controlled, later then bought by AOL, it's now, being, it's now under the banner of HuffPost, which is owned by Verizon. They are not black owned. If you look at the networks in this country, you have TV One and Clio, controlled by Kathy Hughes, Alfred Liggins, black owned, BET, BET Her, not black owned, uh, Bounce Television, uh, owned by Scripps, uh, Michael Katz, not black owned, uh, own the network itself, the network owned with a 50 50 partnership between Oprah and Discovery. She sold 30% um, of it back to uh, back to them. They now control 70 or 80% of own, not black owned. Uh, then I talk about Aspire TV. They are not black owned. 
Revolt, Black on Sean Diddy. You have that Black News Channel, Fledgling Cable Network that just launched uh, in this year as well, led by J.C. Watts. But the but the the majority shareholder is the is the uh, is the is the, uh, the guy who owns the Jacksonville Jaguars, not African American. I'm saying all of this because when you when I go back to the story I've talked about in terms of how you cover things, when you are black owned, you get to make decisions that are in the interest of black people. And you're not having to ask somebody else's opinion. So when I launch my digital net show, uh, that's black owned. That means that I am making those decisions in terms of what we cover. I am not having someone who doesn't look like us saying, no, we're not going to cover that or we're going to focus on this. No, I get to decide what it is that we cover. Why I am I so concerned? I am so concerned about where we're going in the future because we are 23 years away from a nation becoming a majority of people of color. Whites will make up 47 percent of America in 2043. Latinos, African-Americans and Asians and Native Americans will comprise the other 53 percent. And I believe that what black people are doing in 2020 is the exact same thing that black people did when Jackie Robinson went into the major leagues. We can't we didn't know how to do two things at one time. We celebrate Joy Ann Reed getting a prime show on MSNBC after. We celebrate Don Lemon having a prime show on CNN. But do understand, Joe and Reed and Don Lemon do not control and own those shows. They have to ask somebody else. So here we are saying, sure, you got black hosts. But do you have black control? Can a Joanne Reed or a Don Lemon? say I'm going to do a five part series on HBCUs and not have to ask somebody. Can black hosts on mainstream television and let me be real clear. I'm not begrudging any of them. I am perfectly fine with Robin Roberts making 15, 20 million dollars with Good Morning America. I'm fine with Al Roker and Deborah Roberts. I'm fine with Gail King. But what I'm saying is black people can not do what we did with the Negro Leagues and be so enthralled with white validation or working in mainstream that we lose black media, black owned media, because what happens when they say no? Y'all got to remember, BT. Lot covered live the Million Man March. The other networks ignored the Million Man March. They ignored. I worked at the Fort Worth Star Telegram, y'all, when they had one of the planning meetings for the Million Man March in Houston. My editor said, "We don't care." I said, "Well, I'm going. I, I'm going home anyway. I'm gonna go cover it." And then when I came back, they wanted the story. And then when they had a 10,000 10, black men were in Dallas. To the lead up to the Million Man March. They didn't care. I kept pushing them. Then they said, no, you can't cover it because I had written some editorial for the black newspaper. Again, see, y'all got to hear this. When I worked at the Fort Worth Star Telegram, I asked them I wanted to write some opinion pieces. The editor said, no, we weren't interested. I said, fine. I then started writing it for the Houston Defender where I, where I, had, in, where I, had, I had worked 1990. New editor comes in. I mentioned my column. She said, what column? I said, well, I write for the black newspaper. She, she, she said, well, can I see them? She said, why are they? I said, because they said no. She told them, what the hell wrong with y'all? He's good. They start running the columns. Some of y'all just missed that. I knew I had a voice. White editors at the mainstream paper said no. Where was I able to write and use my voice? in the Houston Defender. And what happened? They saw what I was writing in the Houston Defender and said, we need to be running these pieces in our paper. I said, fine. They weren't always going to tell me no, but it was the black paper that told me yes. Which is why when y'all and y'all are seeing David Swirling, and Shamal Singleton, and Paris Denard, and Paul Butler, and when you're seeing Monique Presley, and Yodik Tewelde, and Scott Bolden, and I can go on and on. When you're seeing Laura Coates 
host specials on N on CNN. Ask the question, where did she first host any shows? And that was on TV One's News One Now when I was out. I can name you 30 people who you see frequently on these networks who I put on television first. Because I understood by having a platform that I controlled, I can create an opportunity for folk who otherwise would not get it on the cable networks. Y'all, that's what black media has always done. Black media has always created the space to cover news and issues of interest to black people that they knew were going to get ignored by others. But the problem is black people also were so, have been so desperate for white validation. Oh, if only they could cover us. I'm telling y'all, I've experienced this. I've, exp I'm, I've experienced it from black politicians, from HBCUs, from black CEOs, where it's like, yeah, 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 bro, let me talk to you, but, oh, but, but if they call, if the Post call, if ABC calls, if CNN calls, as opposed to saying, yeah. I'm going to give you the same respect in black media that I'm going to give white media yeah. and I'm not going to say I prefer them over you. True story. I'm really Houston defender. The ma mayor of Houston. Mayor of Houston, Lee Brown, goes to Africa. Go South Africa. Lee Brown, go South Africa. Come back. They took four police officers with a whole, and then and they spent like $75,000. So then I get a phone call. Hey, Roland, this is the communication. This is the chief of staff or the communications director. Hey, we would love to come by with Mayor Brown to talk about the trip, talk about what went on, and talk about all these different things. We'd love to do that. Um, um, uh, so what time can we set? And I said, you done? He said, yeah. This is a true story, y'all. I said, fuck Lee Brown. Now, mind you, Lee Brown's an alpha. I'm an alpha. Why did I tell him that? I said, how the hell y'all gonna call me the top black paper after he comes back from South Africa? After he's getting his ass kicked. So now y'all want to come to me to bail his ass out when you should have called me before you went to South Africa. I said, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna kick his ass in the paper this week. And I was doing a local television station, public affairs. Show. I said, I'm going to kick his ass on TV on Sunday. And then y'all going to learn not to disrespect black media. Then I hung up. What we have to understand, folks, is the situation that we're in right now is you've got to study also what black media is doing today. I'm telling y'all right now, I have grave concerns for what I'm seeing because what I'm not seeing is I'm not seeing black on media today doing original reporting. I'm seeing aggregation. I'm seeing them written by white media, rewriting it, putting their uh, so-and-so staff report on it, and not making individual calls. They're not actually creating relationships with black uh, with HBCUs and black CEOs and black politicians. What they're doing is reporting what somebody else reports. That's not how we tell our story. And we are on the path to where we are going to be asking somebody else to tell our story. And we're going to be in the same situation because let me take this back to baseball. Jackie Robinson goes to the major leagues, influx of black players in the major leagues. What is the percentage of black baseball players today? Less than 7%. If you completely give up your own infrastructure. You're going to be at the behest of somebody else. You're going to be asking somebody else, can I? And then what happens when they say no? What happens when they say, yeah, that Virginia Union announcement isn't really that big? Who's going to know about it? What happens when they say, yeah, you got a nice business, but you're too small. We only cover companies doing $100 million a year. Well, what happens when they say, yeah, you're an activist, but you're not a well-known activist. 
So we're not going to run your opinion piece. Folks, our future cannot be determined by us hoping and praying somebody else covers us fairly. We have got to ensure in the future that if we truly want black folks to be covered fairly, we have got to invest in and support our own, which means we have to have black folks who are working in corporate America challenging their companies saying how much money is going to black owned media. We've got to be challenging political campaigns. How much money are you spending with black owned media? We've got to be telling black politicians, uh, black CEOs and others, don't you dare make folk second rate and ignore them. Last point I make is this year. And I need to correct a whole lot of y'all. Folks said, oh, Roland, you talking black because you you left CNN. Let me help y'all out. I got paid for my opinion by TV one before CNN. Jonathan Rogers said your voice matters. I joined TV one in 2005. I didn't join CNN until 2007. CNN wanted me to leave TV One. When I joined CNN, I was still with TV One. I was with WVON Radio, Black on Radio in Chicago. I had a meeting in 2009 after our election, and I was out. Boy, I'm, the numbers were off the chart, and they were they saw the research. They saw my impact on viewership. And I had a meeting with John Klein, a lunch meeting, and John Klein said, "Well, you gonna get be done because I, I since left WVON, WVON Radio with Tom Jordan Morning Show." He said, "Well, when you gonna be done with?" with all this TV one and Tom Jordan morning show. And I said, when are you going to give me a daily show? Y'all think I'm going to give up all this on the hope of a promise? No, hell no. And then I said, then I might consider it. Let me show y'all power of black media. Winnie Mandela came to Birmingham. They couldn't find anybody to interview her. They asked me, is it wrong? Can you come to Birmingham interview her? Sure. I go to Birmingham, I get 20, 25 minutes with Winnie Mandela. I interview her. They come back and they say, well, why didn't you ask Winnie this? I said, why the hell y'all didn't talk to her? I said, I asked Winnie what the hell I wanted to ask. If y'all want a certain set of questions, y'all asked, it should have went at interview Winnie Mandela. CNN said, we're not going to run it. I said, okay. I went to John Klein. I said, yo, they ain't going to run it. Give me the interview. I'm going to run it on my TV one show. He did. Winnie Mandela died in 2018. When I was in Memphis, it was March it was in February 2018, I think, or some March. And guess what we did? We restreamed that interview. Listen to me clearly. If I did not have a black platform that I controlled, that interview with Winnie Mandela would have never been seen publicly. It would be sitting on a shelf at CNN right now. Y'all would have never, ever known that I interviewed Winnie Mandela unless I told you. But because that was a black platform, TV One, Alfred Hughes, Kathy Liggins owned it. Our host managing editor controlled it. I'll control the content. That's how it aired. My deal was up, CNN was up in 2013. I still had Tom Jordan, still had TV One, launched a daily show. What I'm trying to get y'all to understand is that that's a perfect example. We didn't like, you didn't ask the questions that we wanted you to ask, so the interview is not going to run. But when you have a black owned media platform, you don't have to wait for somebody else's permission. So by launching Roland Martin Unfiltered, this is about creating an entity that is about covering us, that is about being able to amplify our messages, that is about being able to hire black people, it's about being able to cultivate black talent, which is why we are now taking this thing from a single show to actually launching and I'll unveil it later. I already have the name and everything, a Black News and Information Digital Network. Because we will not be able to survive as a people if we are asking somebody else to control our story. You must be challenging Black-owned media right now. And you got to have the sermon, was black, black, was black targeted and Black-owned? Because see, Complex, that ain't Black-owned. Guess what Complex is getting? Black dollars. Y'all didn't hear me. 
complex. So every time y'all reading complex and y'all sharing complex stuff, complex is sucking up money for black people because they say they're black targeted. They're the largest black targeted media. So money ain't going to black people. It's going to mainstream media companies. Y'all better recognize the difference. The opportunity is here. We can do two things at one time. We can watch Robin Roberts support black media. We can watch black people who are on CNN, MSNBC, other networks also support black owned media. Because I'm telling you, and we are to see it now, there will be a time when those networks and those magazines and those newspapers and those websites are going to say no. And y'all going to be saying, well, damn, there's nobody left who is going to say yes. We cannot allow that to happen. Virginia Union, thanks a lot. Questions? All right, we're. Um, thank you, thank so, you much. so much. All right, we got questions. Let's I mean, go. We'll, we'll do a virtual round of applause for that, that awesome. Uh, lecture. Thank you, Roland Martin, for your wonderful insights about the power of black media, black owned media. So we're going to um, entertain a few questions. We have a research associate from the Center for the Study of HBCUs, Jordan Bonner, who will moderate those questions. He's going to be a voiceover. So you'll hear his voice in a moment raising those questions and okay. you're live still, uh, Roland, so you can just answer the cool. questions as they appear. Cool. Take it away, Jordan. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Martin, for your remarks and time. So first question we have. What specific responsibility do our HBCUs have to the sustainability of black media? Uh, first thing is HBCUs uh, have got to have, have got to have um, real communications programs. Uh, I can tell you this, I've traveled around this country. I have, uh, I have seen great deficiencies. There's an opportunity there. Uh, all the people, uh, uh, a lot of excuses that I heard in black newspapers from black publishers. I hear the exact same excuses from HBCUs. Uh, no, there's a lot of black talent out there who can be teaching. Uh, I think HBCUs have got to stop also operating like white institutions where, and again, this is no disrespect to any professor who's gotten their master's or PhD, but let me be real clear. There's not a single professor in America with a master's or PhD who can actually teach students communications who ain't never done. My car right now is a mobile newsroom. We have to be teaching people how to understand. This is not a theoretical, media is not theoretical. It's real. How to shoot, how to record, how to edit is real. And so what should be happening, I really need HBCUs to examine their programs to say, what are we teaching? And I need y'all to listen to me clearly. When I travel around this country, when we do shoots, I typically will actually pull in HBC, HBCU students to help us on these projects. And when I look at the basic lack of knowledge they have on things, it scares the hell out of me. Because what that tells me is they're not being taught the right things. You cannot have a new generation of black folks in media and in black media if they're not being trained properly. And so I would really challenge every HBCU the journalism program or communications program to examine its effectiveness, uh, its efficiency, its efficacy, how effective is it, and allow someone like me and others who live and breathe this to come in and bring in our professional expertise and assess it, not through an academic lens, but through a real world media lens. That's how HBCUs can actually make the difference because here's the deal, if you're able to churn out talent who comes in ready, then they're much better off. But I can tell you right now, and there's no disrespect, and trust me, I've seen the same thing from mainstream. I see a lot significant deficiencies today, which makes no sense when this little thing right here, Steven Soderbergh, go to Netflix, watch the movie High Flying Bird. That entire movie was shot with an iPhone 7, a Netflix film, because you got to know how to use the use this use the technology. And so that's how I would challenge uh, HBCUs to position students and uh, black folks in the future. 
Thank you for those remarks. Um, could you also speak to the importance of HBCU students studying communications to join the National Association for Black Journalists? Well, I, it's important because that's where we're, we're, look, I'm Vice President of Digital. We're the largest uh, minority journalism organization in the world. That's where you get to meet and connect with folks. That's where you can be able to hone your skill set uh, with the resources that we offer as well. Look, you have to be able to align with entities for you to extend your knowledge. The, the stuff that you're learning in school is great, it's fine, it's wonderful. I'm going to be honest with you, it's going to last that long for you in the real world. You need to be able to connect with folks who are out there, networking with people, learning from them. I, the reason I, I became a great negotiator because I, I sat and listened to our elder journalists talk about their own negotiations. And so I heard things that they went through and began to apply that when I came into the profession. So look, I, I've been a member of NABJ since 1989. This is my 31st year. Uh, and so uh, it has been invaluable uh, to my uh, career. Uh, and so I encourage anyone to do so. Uh, but you've got to absolutely go outside of your circle and, and you and you got you got to grab it you got to build i can't tell you how important it is where you build knowledge and you build skill set and you learn all the different things and and look I, i'll be 52 years old next month i am constantly learning i am constantly learning new things look i got jd who are like damn we can't keep up with you because it's a constant state of knowledge a pursuit of knowledge to understand how our world is changing and that's where we have to be. Awesome, awesome. Uh, kind of a follow up to that. How can the media with HBCU contributions be used as an instrument to empower black youth and future generations? I know you talked um, about HBCUs making sure they have more efficient and um, you know just better communications programs. So what would you say, yeah, you know, um, in regards to that? Well, look, we're living now in an indigenous world, so here's the deal. Um, stop asking them. Stop asking them. Here's the piece. Every, I, I, I've actually, I've actually, so again, like I say, I've traveled. I've, I've spoken at more than, I've done 19 commencements, 17 HBCUs. I've done, I've spoken at probably 55 or 60. And here's what is crazy. Right now, we're live streaming this speech on my YouTube channel, Facebook channel, Periscope. I don't understand why every HBC not using their social media platform to do that. COVID has forced folks to go vote. But do you understand how many other events that go on for you personally? But here's the other deal. Not throwing this out. You say want to impact you. The perfect example. Two years now, I have a daily digital show. I've made I've said this before, and I had some other black folks get mad at me. Digest and smother food. I really don't care. But I'm a six, I don't care. Because it has it's real. I rarely, when I say rarely, I'm talking about a few schools, reach out to want to their, their expert professionals, professors on the show to talk in public policy, talk about the election. If you are an HBCU with a political science department, you should be saying, who are the top political science voices that we have in our department, and why aren't we getting them on black radio, on digital shows, out there talking about what's happening right now? You don't wait for somebody to call you. Every HBCU should have a Skype credit. Let me make one last one now. Setting up a Skype video to have a clear connection, great backdrop, great camera. That way, hey, network with somebody, we got it. Now, y'all know we don't have the same. Yeah, y'all know we don't have the same. So, so as you think, I see you, hey, so it's now changed. So I am saying is to actually not wait for somebody to call you with a few five year old message. Using that, using Facebook, using YouTube, using Periscope, using Instagram in a much more organic way. I still believe 
against bands and practicing sororities and was kept from the door. And I think this question is for me. I'm not doing a single band. on bands of practice sorority. But value is that to me is where a lot of the things uh should be made. Every single person, every single person has to say this. So they say this every HBC president should be saying their communication staff don't be trying to get people to be in radio Faculty out there. Because see, now imagine, imagine what it's going to be like. Here's the end, you can now be tested for the first thing you do. And then we have uh, somebody out there talking about white dick evangelical. You got somebody from your school of religion. Now imagine black Boston folks who she goes out talking about the apostles of the law. Like, imagine all of a sudden, first state, local state, with the union, we're seeing it in the local state, we're seeing it in the state, we're seeing it out. You know what I'm saying? So I believe the president have got to challenge themselves and their staffs to say, how are we I should be saying, y'all, Lord, please, I should be doing every day. Uh, Mr. Martin, um, we're just having some technical difficulties. Would you mind just speaking a little bit closer to the uh, to the mic um, for our last question? I speak loud. I don't, that ain't me. I guarantee you. <laughs> I know I had an issue with projection. <laughs> All right, I appreciate it. We just have one last question. Um, so how can HBCUs connect with and engage black owned media to tell the HBCU story better? First of all, what's the HBCU story? See, before you connect with somebody, you got to actually articulate what it is you're actually trying to do. So what I've described for you is the HBCU story is not a story. You have HBCU stories. You have HBCU angles. You have HBCU perspectives. So before you pick the phone up and call somebody, you got to do an analysis of yourself. So Virginia Union should say, who are our top 10 experts and what's their subject matter? Okay. Then go to them and say, look, are you, because look, everybody ain't trying to do media. Some folks just want to do research. They don't want to do nothing. But then say, what are you willing to do? Now avail themselves of that. I'm doing eight hours of election night coverage. That's going to be simulcast on iHeartRadio's Black Information Network stations more than 20 or 30 stations across the country. I'm trying to understand how every HBCU is not trying to get their political science professor or their subject matter experts, if they got experts on voting rights, experts on polling or whatever, on the show. I'm telling you right now, they're not. So you got to first analyze what story am I telling? What, what's my internal story? What, what really is it? What am I trying to project? 
And so then you got to realize everything is not about also, well, it's going to make the campus look good. No, 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 no. Listen, it's about the information. If I've got a Virginia Union professor making frequent media appearances with a Virginia Union backdrop and Virginia Union in the Chiron, that's a level of branding you can't purchase. See what I'm saying? You're thinking totally different. That's what I'm trying to get you to do. So once you do that, now when you go to media, you now gotta, gotta break it down. What are the black newspapers? What are the black media outlets in Virginia? What are the black media outlets in the region? What are the black outlets nationally? Then you gotta say, okay, let me examine our, our, our students. Where are our students coming from? If all of a sudden I've got a significant number of students coming from Chicago or coming from uh, Houston, I want to make sure that I'm communicating with black media in Chicago, black media in Houston. you got to have a plan of action that you have to put the work in before you connect with the black media. Here's what happens too much. Folk connect me. And then I now got to work. Well, this, 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 that, and the other, because they haven't gone through all of that. And so that's really where I think HBCUs uh, should be. I'm really focusing on that and the opportunity and understanding. I don't do lots of stories on universities. I don't. What I do do is I, 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 I cover the news and I can integrate expert voices into my coverage to serve as a panelist or a subject matter expert, but still serves as the same purpose of telling your story because now your experts are being represented. So every time Greg Carr, here's the deal. I got other speakers in the lineup for our distinguished lecture series. We've got in our lineup, Michael Eric Dyson. We've got sports analyst, Jalen Rose. We've got pastor and gospel recording artist, Charles Jenkins, Will Stute, Larry Millers from Jordan Brands. I mean, the list goes on. So certainly want you to grab a neighbor, tell a friend, professors bring your classes, students bring your clubs and organizations, grandmas and grandpas, aunties, uncles, grab the whole community and come and join us. We're taking the HBCU experience to the globe through our VUU Global Initiative here at Virginia Union University. And we are so delighted that you took time to join us here for the first lecture. We'll see you this same time next Wednesday at 12 o'clock p.m. noon Eastern time for the presidential distinguished lecture series. Take care.